Welcome to the Secrets of the Bible channel. Did giants, descendants of Anak, actually exist? Who are the descendants of Anak? To answer this question, we must first look at their forefathers, the Nephilim, who existed prior to the flood. Genesis chapter 6. Let's look at what the Bible says about Nephilim. Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wise for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy men whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. The Nephilim, described only here in the Bible, were demonized men, whose sexual intimacy with women led to a demonized society. They had given themselves over to powers of darkness so fully, it seems, that they became powerful men. Yet their dark powers were no match for the Creator God. God wouldn't only take so much evil, so He announced a 120-year window for people to repent, after which judgment would come. We have fallen a long way from Genesis chapter 3. What began with Adam and Eve's sin grew in Cain's murderous ways and bore fruit in Lamech's boastful violence. It's now in full bloom throughout the entire human race. God looked on the earth and saw that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time. People had become comprehensible corrupt, manufacturing evil at the highest possible level. This pained God. Chapter 6, verse 6, and it moved him to action. God's Spirit would no longer shield men from his just judgment, as he issued a decree of total destruction. Taken from the King James Version, the passage gives us a clue that people prior to the flood grew to an enormous size, especially when mating with fallen angels. At least the passage seems to indicate this. Numbers chapter 13, verse 33. There we saw the giants. The descendants of Anna came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. This message, delivered by the twelve spies who scouted the promised land, appeared to imply that descendants of the Nephilim existed after the flood. Were the descendants of Anak truly giants? In addition to the passages stated, that seemed to indicate Anak's descendants hailed from the mighty men formed by the Nephilim, we can venture a guess that they were tall in some way. Who was Anak in the Bible? The Anakim race is named after Anaki, the son of Arba. Simple enough. But what all do we know about him? Joshua chapter 15 verse 13 is the only place where we learn about his ancestors. We know Arba, Anak's father, heads up a city. Joshua chapter 21 verse 11 Joshua chapter 15 verse 13 Now to Caleb the son of Jephunneh, he gave a share among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, namely Kerjath Arba, which is Hebron. Arba was the father of Anak. Joshua chapter 21 verse 11 and they gave them Kerjath Arba. Arba was the father of Anak, which is Hebron in the mountains of Judah, with a common land surrounding it. Arba was based in Hebron, which was previously known as Kerjath Arba in his honor when Israelite spies looked over Canaan. They thought his descendants were giants because of his stature. Caleb was later given the city of Hebron as a reward for his faith in God's ability to help the Israelites defeat the Anakites. You, the word Anakim most likely means long necked, which translates to tall. They were thought to be Nephilim descendants by the Hebrews. The Israelites' journey from Horb to Kadesh Barnea was anything but easy. They had to make their way through a terrifying wilderness. When they reached the outskirts of Canaan, however, Moses could point to it and say, See, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up there and take possession. Do not be afraid. It was at that point that they sent twelve scouts, one from each tribe, to explore the land. When they returned from their survey, the scouts declared, The land the Lord our God is giving us is good. But things rapidly went downhill from there. 
the people rebelled against the Lord and grumbled when ten cowardly men among the scouts claimed the inhabitants were giants in cities fortified to the heavens. They even claimed that God had led them from Egypt to be slaughtered by the Amorites because he despised them. Years later, the Lord would say, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the people of Israel, the very ones for whom he so tenderly and graciously supplied, represented the love of God as hatred. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. But you were unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents and said, The Lord hates us. So he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go? Our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. They say the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. Moses attempted to rally the people by reminding them that the Lord would go ahead of them and fight for them, just as he had done in Egypt and the wilderness. Fear, however, had rendered the Israelites deaf and blind to God's goodness. Unfortunately, they did not believe him. This infuriated him to the point where he swore an oath that no one from that evil generation would ever enter the good land he had promised. Only Caleb and Joshua, the two scouts who responded faithfully when faced with apparent obstacles, would inherit the promised land. Even Moses wasn't spared this tragic fate. The Lord also forbade him from coming inside the land, rather of talking to a rock so that it would provide water. As God commanded, Moses had struck it with his staff, also effectively claiming to share in God's glory for the provision of the water. In mentioning this incident, Moses wasn't blaming the people for his sin, but reminding them that their grumbling had been so contagious that it caused him to sin, too. Joshua, Moses' faithful servant, would lead the people in his place. The people of Israel refused to enter the land on their first opportunity, claiming that their children would be plunder for the nations who lived there. God, ironically, used their excuse against them. In reality, they would be excluded from the promised land and would perish in the wilderness, while their children would inherit it. People, realizing their error, reacted to this sentence by foolishly attempting to conquer Canaan. So they were thrashed because God was not on their side. They arrived back at camp in tears, but without any genuine repentance. God ignored their requests because of the rebellious hearts. That serves as a warning to all of us that he wishes to be approached with genuine repentance and humility. The children of Israel were forced to wander in the wilderness for another 38 years before due to their fear of the Anakim and the rebellion against God. During the conquest of Canaan, Joshua drove the Anakim out of the hill country and Caleb eventually drove them out of Hebron. The small remnant, however, sought refuge in the city of Gaza, Gath and Ashdod. Joshua chapter 11 verse 22. Many Bible scholars believe that the Anakim's descendants were the Philistine giants that David faced, such as Goliath of Goth. People have speculated about Goliath's height for a long time. Then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath from Goth, whose height was six cubits in a span. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 4. We don't understand precisely what cubits in a span means at face value, because we don't measure things by a cubit or a span. We measure them by feet and inches. So, let's put it into our lingo. Goliath was somewhere near 5 feet 9 inches tall, an enormous man. The NBA would love him. And if you add to his height the length of his arms when he would lift them up over his head, you can imagine what an imposing creature he must have been. 2 Samuel chapter 21 verses 15 to 22. Now the Philistines were at war again with Israel. David went down with his servants. And as they fought against the Philistines, David became weary. Then Ishmael Benab, who was among the descendants of the giant, the weight of whose spear was 300 shekels, 6 pounds of bronze, was armed with a new sword, and he intended to kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to David's aid, and struck and killed the Philistine. Then David's men swore to him, You shall not go out again with us to battle, so that you do not extinguish the lamp of Israel. After this, there was war again with the Philistines at Gob, Gezir. At that time, Sebeki the Hushanite killed Saph, Sipai, who was among the descendants of the giants. There was war with the Philistines again at Gob, and Elhanan, the son of Jari Oregam, a Bethlehemite, killed Goliath the Gittite, whose spear shaft was like a weaver's beam. 
There was war at Gath again, where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, twenty-four in number. He also was a descendant of the giants, and when he taunted and defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shammai, David's brother, killed him. These four warriors were descended from the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hands of David and his servants. 1 Samuel, chapter 17, verses 4 to 7. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span, and he had an helmet of brass upon his head. And he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of brass. And he aggrieves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders, and, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. But we can ascertain that his descendants had earned a reputation, so much so, that even though the Israelites had crossed the Red Sea and witnessed miracles in the wilderness, they didn't think they could face the descendants of Anak, many generations removed from the original Anak. This should give us an idea of Anak and his original sons who roamed the earth's surface. In either case, the Israelites should have had faith in God. How could God not bring the descendants of Anak and Jericho to their knees after bringing the former Nephilim to their knees? What can we learn from these descendants? God's power is unrivaled by the giants. During the flood, the Nephilim were destroyed by his power. Anak's descendants literally fell with the walls of Jericho. Goliath was knocked unconscious by a stone to the forehead. No matter what giant stands in our path, we know that God can overcome anything too big for us.